that together. Where's this the way?
today we're starting a new Bible study, a new book. And let me tell you how we got where we are. So I want you to turn to two portions of Scripture. Uh, I want you to turn to our main text, which will be 2 Peter chapter 1. And then I want you to mark one simple cross-reference, which is uh, Exodus chapter 21. And we'll begin at 2 Peter chapter 1 in a minute. But let me tell you how we got here, because we're, we're on this progression that the Lord is leading. Last fall, it was probably the end of August, early September, I was praying about what our next book study would be on Sunday morning. And I was very burdened by what was going on in the world around us. You know, we had a pandemic. We had just had a rough election and we, you know, our, our, our world was in turmoil. But what I was so concerned about is the fact that it was impacting the church so deeply. And so I started praying and asking God, you know, God, I don't want to just choose a next book and just teach generically. Lord, I, I want you to give me a series of studies that will help our church know how to navigate this changing landscape in the United States of America. And God led me to do a series from the book of Daniel called Standing Firm in a Falling World. And so we studied the book of Daniel, and what Daniel taught us is how a Christian can stand firm on the Word of God when the world around them is just crumbling. And then when we got to the end of Daniel, I prayed and I said, okay, you know, Lord, what's next? And he led me to 1 Peter, and we did a series called Standing Firm in a Hostile World. And let me tell you, Daniel was all about the church, I'm sorry, Daniel was all about the church standing firm when the world is crumbling. First Peter was all about the church standing firm when we are being attacked from the outside through persecution and things of that nature. Well, today we're going to start a study in Second Peter that we are calling Standing Firm on Challenged Ground. And let me tell you why I've chosen this series title. Can I tell you why? Because that's what my wife told me to do. No, dead serious, because I, had, I came up with this idea that I wanted to communicate to you guys that, that from within the church, there's so much false doctrine and false teaching and things that are going on that are distracting Christians. And I kept going to Kelly with these, these, these series titles that I thought was going to work. And I would say, well, how about this? And she's like, no, not yet. And I'd give her another one, another one. She goes, how about standing firm on challenged ground? I'm like, that's it. So Kelly needs to get credit for that. Credit where credit is due, right? So when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. And so our, our series title is going to be Standing Firm on Challenged Ground. And this is what you need to know is that when Peter wrote his first epistle, the churches that he wrote to listened to what he taught them. And they continued to thrive and they stood strong in the face of Roman persecution and they continued to make disciples and they continued to live godly lives as they were being persecuted from outside. Those same churches now Peter is writing to and Peter notices that from within the church, the church has a new attack. Satan couldn't get the church from the outside, so Satan takes a new tack, and that is to start planting false teachers and apostates within the church. And they were beginning to influence the church with false doctrine and false practices, and Peter says, I'm going to write and I'm going to teach the church how to overcome persecution from within, or excuse me, um, false doctrine from within. So today's message title is The Fruit of Knowing God. And we're going to read the text, and then I'm going to tell you how we're going to get where we're going to go. So just look up at the screen, or if you have your Bible, read along. But First Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, Peter says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God our Savior, or excuse me, God, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, 
by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let's pray. Father, we, we've read the text. We've talked about where we're going. And now, Lord, we pray that you would send your spirit to be our teacher today. And I pray, Lord, that as we look at this introduction that Peter wrote to these churches, that we would be able to glean things that you want to talk to us about personally, individually, and then as a church in order to help us stand strong as we deal with false teachers and false practices within the church. And so, Lord, I do pray that you would help us to stand firm as the ground we're standing on is being challenged. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. If you've been here at Calvary for any period of time, you know that whenever we start a new book of the Bible, we always do an introduction to that book by looking at something that I like to call the five A's. We look at the author. We look at the audience. We look at the atmosphere that the recipients were living in. We look at the author's agenda, and then we look at a personal application for our lives. And so we're going to do that today by looking at First Pe- Second Peter, excuse me, chapter one, verses one through four. And I, I want to just share something before we dig into the text because I think this is important. I say this a lot, and I say to you that there's a transition that takes place in a believer's life when they learn to stop reading their Bible. You ever heard a pastor tell you to stop reading your Bible? We have to transition at some point from reading our Bible to studying our Bible. And so reading is super important. I would never tell you don't read your Bible. But you've got to learn to study your Bible. You've got to learn to actually be a student of the Word. And one of the things you learn is that when you're reading some of these New Testament epistles, the introductions to these New Testament epistles are extremely important. Like, I'll share with you, We've all gotten so used to text messages, and the idea with text messages, in my mind, is shorter is better, right? Yo, want to go eat? You know, you got the message. Shall we go get something, right? Now, as a professional, sometimes I have to send an email to somebody, and that's not good. Yo, how's it going? You don't want to get an email from me that says something like that. What you want to get is an email that has an introduction that gives you an idea of what the email is about, and then you read the body of the email, and then the action items and then you know what to do with it. And that's the way the Bible works, is that the authors of Scripture, during their introductions, are giving you this broad overview of the entire book most of the time. And today, that's what Peter is doing with these four verses. And so, let's begin by getting an idea of what Second Peter is all about by just looking at these four verses. And we'll begin by looking at the author. And so, notice here in verse 1, that the author identifies himself as Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, when we get to chapter 2, Peter's going to show us that there were men within the church that were bringing in false doctrines and false practices. And Peter's going to say, I want you to think about the character of these men. Most of them are prideful, most of them are arrogant, and they're extremely self-serving. And so what Peter will do here during this introduction is he's going to use himself as an example of what a trustworthy church leader should look like. And he begins by saying that a church leader should exhibit humility. And and I'll prove this to you because Peter introduces himself with two names, Simon Peter. And again, we've got to ask ourselves, why would he do this? You know, we live in the South, and there's a lot of men in the South that have two names, like Billy Bob, right? I love the South. I really love the South. Wish I had two names. We go to places for sandwiches like Jimmy John's. And so sometimes you look at Scripture, and you're like, okay, Simon Peter. It's just he had, you know, he's one of those guys with two names. But, But there's so much more here. You see, Simon was Peter's given name. This is the name that his parents gave him when he was born. And if you do a little bit of study, you, you come to find out that the, the name Simon means hearkening, to hear, to listen. And if you're a parent, you understand that many parents give their children a name hoping that they're 
child will live up to the namesake. So what Peter's parents were saying is we hope that our son is going to grow into a man who learns to listen to God's voice and then who learns to apply what God is saying to him. I want my son to be a hearkener of God. Well, as you read through the Gospels, you find that Peter is nothing like that. Every time we read about Peter before the book of Acts, when he got filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter is listening to Jesus, and then before Jesus seems to get the sentence out of his mouth, Peter interrupts and says something that he quickly regrets saying, and then a lot of times he also turns around and does something that he quickly regrets doing, like cutting off somebody's ear with a sword. So Peter was not the listener who paid attention to Jesus and then did what Jesus did. He was the exact opposite. But you see, Jesus comes along and he had a plan to transform Simon into an effective leader. And that plan began when Jesus changed his identity by changing his name. Look up at the screen if you would. It's recorded in John chapter 1 verse 42. And John says, now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah, you shall be called Kephas, which is translated a stone. I know we're all used to saying Cephas, but, but it's an Aramaic word. It's actually translated as Kephas, and it means a little stone. Your name is Pebble. Okay. Now, later on, we get the Greek equivalent, which is Peter, and that means a rock. And if you pay attention to what's going on here, Jesus is saying, it's not okay that you continue being who you are, so I'm going to change your name by, I'm going to change your identity by changing your name. And so he says, Peter, I need you to start seeing yourself the way I see you. You are no longer the listener who doesn't listen and do what God says. You are now the little pebble that's going to grow into a big rock. And I love this story. You want to know why? Is because most of us come into the kingdom of God like Simon did. We're slow to listen, we're quick to speak, and we're quick to do things that we quickly regret. And Jesus says, I can't leave you like that, so I'm going to do something and I'm going to transform you. In this case... He did it by changing his name, by changing his identity. He says, hey, listen, you who don't listen and do what I say, you're now a little pebble, but you are going to grow into a big rock that I'm going to build upon at some point, Peter. And I love this. More than 30 years before Peter writing this, these things took place. And over the course of 30 years, Peter is now walking with Jesus, and then he's serving Jesus. And as he looks back, he would never forgot where he came from, but he never stopped becoming what Jesus called him to become. And this is humility. This is a great character trait in the life of a leader. The second thing that Peter shows us here about himself is that he was not only a man of humility, but he was a man who exercised what we call servant leadership. And we see this as he calls himself a bondservant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, I can't tell you how refreshing this series that we're doing on Wednesday nights on servant leadership has been to me. I, I've been so blessed by this that I go home after Wednesday night and I can't sleep because God is just, he's working as much in me as he is in anybody else. And it's well, I guess it's kind of exhausting because I'm not sleeping, but I've been so encouraged by what God is doing on Wednesday nights in our church, teaching us about servant leadership. The one thing I want you to see is that Peter was always a leader. If you start reading through the Bible, you realize he was a leader from the very beginning, but he wasn't a very good leader because he wasn't a servant leader. And so Peter is telling us here that over 30 years of life and ministry, he began to understand and to practice what we call servant leadership. And this is illustrated to us through the words that he used. I want you to notice, I'm going to read to you here from verse 1, then I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Exodus 21. 
But Peter introduced himself as a bondservant of Jesus Christ before he introduced himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now flip to Exodus 21. The word bondservant that Peter used is the Greek word doulos. It's found all over the New Testament, and it literally means a slave or a servant. And you can't understand this idea of bondservant in the New Testament unless you really go back to its origins in Exodus chapter 21. And this is a chapter that outlines the guidelines of slave ownership in ancient Israel. Now remember that slavery in the biblical times was very different than slavery in the early years of our nation. They were completely different and you can't compare the two. The slavery in the Bible actually was, was a, a good thing. And please don't freak out on that, but I'll show you why in a minute. The most reason, the most common reason that a Hebrew person would become a slave to another Hebrew person was to work off a debt that they couldn't pay. So I want you to think about this. Let's say that, that you come into a community and you want to start your own little, you know, farm. And, and so you're starting to, you know, plow the ground and you're working and stuff. And you notice that your next door neighbor has this huge thriving farm and lots of animals. So you go to him and you say, hey, how do I get started? And he says, well, hey, I'll, I'll lend you some seed and I'll sell you a couple of goats and you just need to pay me back. And, you know, so you start planting the seed and you start raising these goats. And before you know it, the goats are dead and the field's not growing and you are belly up, okay? And you realize, I'm not a very good farmer. I should have stuck with banking or something like that. And so you go to your neighbor and you say, listen, um, the animals I bought from you are dead and the field isn't growing. I, I'm basically bankrupt. And he says, that's okay. You can become a servant and you can live in my home and you can eat my food and I'll give you work to do. And over the course of six years, you will work off this debt and in the seventh year, you'll be set free. That's what Exodus 21 teaches. And so now in verses five and six, I want to tell you a, a, a biblical story that'll help you understand Peter. It says, if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will, go out, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl. Just real quick, most Bible scholars believe they would then put an earring in to identify this person as a bond slave. And then it says, and he shall serve him forever. So at the end of the six years, your, your creditor comes to you and he says, hey, listen, you've done a great job working off your debt. You can go. And you realize, I have never had it so good as living in my master's home. I've got a place to live. I've got work. You know, I've, I'm raising a family. I'm treated like family. So you say, no, I don't want to go. I, I want to continue to serve you. And then the master would say, well, let's go down to the, the elders of the city. And you guys would both tell your story. And they would do a public record. And even though you're supposed to be a free man, you're now a bond slave to your master. And they put an earring in your ear and you go back to work. And I want to show you here from verse 5, the motive was love. And in verse 6, the commitment was lifelong. So when Peter chooses this word bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's saying is he said, you know, I could live as a free man, but I find it better in the Lord's house as his servant. So he says, I'm going to spend the rest of my life as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I could do anything I want, but I want to be a servant of Jesus. So as you turn back to 2 Peter chapter 1, you can say, why did Peter feel this way? Well, 30 years before writing this, he spent three and a half years with Jesus as a disciple. And then on the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter had his worst failure of his life where he denied Jesus three times. Then he watched Jesus get arrested and beaten and crucified and they laid his body in the grave. And Peter felt like he was the worst failure in the whole world until shortly after the resurrection where Jesus met him on the beach and had breakfast with him and restored him. And Peter said, I can't even imagine being anywhere but in my master's house. And this is where I want to be. And Peter says, I'm going to spend the rest of my life 
serving Jesus as a bond servant. That set him up to play the bigger role that Jesus had in his life. If you're looking back at verse 1, he calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. And the word apostle means one who is sent. And so Peter says, hey, 30 years ago, at that event that we call the Great Commission, Jesus sent me out into the world as an evangelist and a pastor and a teacher and a church planter. And he says, it's been my job for the last 30 some years to go out and to lead people to Christ and then to build the church. And it's very interesting here because I think Peter is building on something that Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2. In a minute, we'll put it up on the screen. But Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 is talking about the church and the origins of the church and what the church is. And he says that in the Old Testament, the church was a mystery. In other words, the Old Testament prophets and the believers in the Old Testament had no idea that this thing that you and I enjoy called the church was ever going to exist. And so Paul teaches in Ephesians 2, he says, the church is this new work of God made up of Jew and Gentile. And he says, together, we're serving the Lord. How did the church get built? Well, second, or second chapter of Ephesians, verse 20, Paul says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So I think what Peter was referring to is he's saying, hey, listen, if you really pay attention to what an apostle is, he said, the 12 of us who were commissioned apostles by Jesus, we were the ones that, that, that looked at Jesus as the chief cornerstone of the church, but we had the privilege of laying the foundation through teaching doctrine and theology. And he says, I'm one of 12 guys who had the privilege of being able to lay the foundation of the church in Acts chapter 2, it was referred to as the apostles' doctrine, that body of biblical truth that we call the apostles' doctrine. And Peter says, I'm one of 12 guys that had the privilege of teaching what's called the apostles' doctrine. And what he's saying, he says, first I told you that I'm a bondservant. He says, but you need to also listen to me. He says, I am an apostle. And in chapter 2, we're going to find out that there were other men who had come into the church and they were calling themselves apostles and they were teaching things that were not proper to be taught in the church of Christ. And I just want to kind of throw out something here. We'll get to the application towards the end. But I'm going to tell you that anytime somebody identifies themselves as an apostle in the church today, the, the hair on the back of my neck stands up. I am the apostle, so and so. Because they never say it with humility. They're not just, hey man, I just, you know, God called me to be an apostle. And I'm a, and so, no, it's always, I am the apostle. You know what I mean? They've always got this big personality because there's somebody special. Listen, there were 12 apostles. And God used them to lay the, the biblical foundation for what we believe as the church. And if what somebody is teaching gets outside of the scope of what we call the apostles' doctrine, we need to look at them sideways and say, hey, first of all, why are you calling yourself an apostle? And second of all, why are you teaching things that are not lining up with Scripture? So, so this is what I want you to see just right here in this introduction. Peter is going, listen, I know who I was, and I know who I'm becoming in Christ. He says, I also want you to know that I'm a servant. I am a servant leader, but I am an apostle. So when I start giving correction, you guys need to pay attention and choose whether you're going to listen to me, Peter says, or to these other guys who are teaching weird wonky things. And we'll talk about that as we get later into the Bible study. So we've looked at who the author is. Let's look at the audience. This is also in verse 1. He's writing to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just quickly so you know, it's very clear that Peter is writing to the same group of churches that he was writing to in the first epistle. Because later in this epistle, he'll say, hey, I wrote to you in my first epistle. So it's the same group of churches. But what he's doing here is, is he's letting them know some important things. I, I love how Peter describes them. He says, you are people who share my faith. Notice that. 
to those who have obtained like precious faith with us. Peter's basically saying, hey, you know, there, there's a, a, a biblical truth that all Christians are supposed to hold to. And he says, you guys are holding to that. You have a like, a similar faith, the same faith. But notice what else he says. He calls it a like precious faith. When Peter talked about his faith, he used the word precious to speak of it. And I'm going to tell you that in my young days uh, as a Bible reader, this always freaked me out. And I'm going to tell you why is because the word precious just doesn't seem like it fits with a big burly fisherman, right? Can you imagine Peter and he's pulling in the the, the nets and he's sweaty and burly and his muscles are bulging and he wants to talk to you about something precious, okay? Now I would read my Bible and go, Peter, are you getting in touch with your feminine side? What's going on here? I'm going to tell you why, because that word precious to me, I think the only time I ever even heard it used in my life was about those little things that they sold at the Christian bookstore called the Precious Moments Collection. You know, and those are things that a lot of women would probably have on their shelf, but I can't imagine a man on his toolbox, he goes, check out my little precious moments thing I've got going on, right? And so as a young Bible reader, I used to think, Peter, what's going on, man? You got to pick your words a little bit better here, bro. But I want to tell you what this word means. This word means valuable. So Peter says, you have obtained the same faith. He says, but this is a precious, valuable faith. And what was it that made Peter's faith so valuable? Well, we learned that in the first epistle. Look up on the screen. Chapter 1 of 1 Peter, verses 18 and 19, he says, You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter is saying, listen, this is what makes our faith precious and valuable is the price that was paid that we could have this faith. The father gave his son to leave heaven and come die on a cross for us. The son left heaven and came to earth and died for us. That makes our faith extremely valuable. And one of the things I want to ask you as a Christian today is when you think about your faith, would you use words like precious and valuable to talk about your faith? Or are you one of those Christians that's just like, yeah, I go to church. Well, what church do you go to? I can't remember the name. Well, where is it? Maybe I know where it is. Well, they've moved since I've been there last and I don't know where they went. Okay, well, what denomination is? Are, are, are you a Baptist? Are you a Presbyterian? What's a, what's a denomination? Okay, there's a lot of Christians out there and when you start talking to them, you realize that their faith is not very valuable to them. You know when you know that your faith is extremely valuable? It's when somebody says something negative about Christianity or about Jesus and the hair on the back of your neck stands up and you're like, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to not act like a Christian right now. You know, maybe that was a bad analogy, but... I think that we're living in a day and age where it's super cool to be a Christian. Have you noticed that? That's that's cool, man. I'm a Christian, you know. But how deep is your relationship with the Lord? Are are you like these people that Peter was talking to? You got the same faith as Peter, and that faith is precious. It is valuable. We have to sometimes ask ourselves, how valuable is our faith today? Let's move on because we're going to run out of time. Peter's going to move on now to the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is what was going on in the lives of the readers that he's writing to. And notice here, I hope you're looking at your Bible. Verse 1, he says, To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, if you remember, as I said it just about every week, as we went through 1 Peter, I reminded you that the atmosphere in 1 Peter was that the church was being attacked and persecuted from outside. Here in 2 Peter, the church was under attack from within by false teachers and apostates that had crept into the church. 
And when we get to chapter 2, Peter is going to get very detailed about talking about the false teachers themselves, their character, their false teachings, their false practices, how they manipulate people, and all these other things. But before he talks about the false, Peter spends some time in this introduction talking to us about the real. And he says, before you can identify false, you have to be very familiar with the truth. So Peter says, I'm going to give you two essential doctrines here that you really need to understand if you're going to be able to recognize false doctrine when it starts creeping into the church. And so he's going to define what biblical salvation is. He's going to tell you what real salvation is. And then we'll go to a second one in a minute. But notice he says, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am blown away from time to time. I told you guys this story a while back. I taught through the whole book of Romans. Romans is about how you get saved. Chapter after chapter after chapter about how you get saved. And uh, an elderly lady in our church came to me, and, and it was right when I finished Romans. She had been there for every week. And she said, hey, can we talk about a couple of things? I want to talk about becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. I was so excited about that. And we sat down in the fellowship hall in our old building, and, and I said, what do you want to talk about? And she started asking some questions that made me a little uncomfortable. So I said, hey, let's talk about your salvation. How do you know you're going to heaven? Well, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. Sixteen chapters of the book of Romans. She was there every week, and she still didn't know how to get saved. I am the worst Bible teacher in the whole world, is what I took away from that conversation. No, it came down to she was the worst listener in the world because I had taught what biblical salvation is, justification by faith. And she still wants to say she's going to heaven because she's a good person. Do you realize that across our nation today, churches are filled with people who think they're going to heaven because they are good people? And maybe there's someone here today, this is going to be a day that's, that's revelatory to you because you're going to learn that we don't go to heaven by being good people. You know how we go to heaven? By being sinners that ask a savior to save them. Notice here, Peter says that salvation comes from obtaining faith. I love this. I love what Peter did here. He, he's just talking to people about things they understand. You and I know that we receive things, we obtain them by exchanging something. Like, you're going to get up on Monday morning and you're going to go exchange 40 hours of your week for this thing called a paycheck. Agreed? And then you're going to go exchange some of the money that you earned for groceries and gas, okay? You obtain through exchange. And Peter is saying, that's how salvation works. You get salvation by exchanging something. Look up at the screen. I, I realized I use this verse every week. We might as well be burned into our screen. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Paul says becoming a true Christian requires an exchange. You exchange your sin for the righteousness of Christ and then you're saved. That's how salvation takes place. And Peter is trying to remind his audience, you're going to hear all sorts of wonky things about how you get saved from these false teachers. And he says, but you need to run everything through this little filter. And that is that salvation is obtained through an exchange. My sin is exchanged for Christ's righteousness. So when a false teacher comes in and says, no, the way you're saved is by becoming a member of our denomination and being baptized, then you're saved. Ah, doesn't meet the criteria. The way that you're saved is by sowing your seed faith gift into my Harley fund. And much as I want to say it, that is the truth. No, not really. Ah, right? There needs to be an uh, an exchange. And Paul says that's how we get saved. I want you to notice also, I'm sorry, Peter. Peter defined now the nature of Jesus. And Peter says, listen, as false teachers come in, they're going to focus on false doctrine about salvation and they're going to focus on false doctrine about the nature of Jesus, of who Jesus is. Here in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2, 
he defined the nature of Jesus. Or is it verse 1? Are we still in verse 1? We are. He says, he, he referred to Jesus as our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter came along and he said, listen, Jesus is our Savior, but you need to understand that he's also our God. He is God the Son, second person of the Holy Trinity. He says, you need to know this because this is going to fall under attack. Do you see this under attack in the world that we live in today, the nature of Jesus, who he is? Let me share a couple of things, and these are the easy ones to pick on, but they'll knock on our doors and you need to be prepared. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus is the Son of God, but not God the Son. And I'll read to you, these are, this picture and these quotes are direct cut and paste from JW.org. And on the Jehovah's Witness website, it says, Yes, we believe in Jesus who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. We have faith that Jesus came to earth from heaven and gave his perfect human life as a ransom sacrifice. Are you okay with that? I mean, that's, that's all biblical, right? Now, look at the next paragraph. However, Take Jesus at his word when he said, the Father is greater than I am, John 14, 28. So we do not worship Jesus as we do not believe that he is almighty God. And so the Jehovah's Witnesses who identify as Christians have a doctrine that's very different from the Bible. And I'm going to prove that to you in a minute. But let's go on. I want to show you what, what the Mormon church teaches. They claim to be Christians right from their website. They teach that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. He is Satan's equal opposite. And notice what their website says about Jesus. They say the Holy Trinity is the term many Christian religions use to describe God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Latter-day Saints believe very strongly in the three, but we don't believe that they're all the same person. We do believe that they are one in purpose. Their purpose is to help us achieve true joy in this life and in the life to come, which we also believe in. And so directly from the Mormons' main website, they're saying we don't believe that Jesus is God the Son. We don't believe in the Holy Trinity. So what does the Scripture say? Well, let me show you from both John and Paul and then back to Peter. John 1, verses 1 and 2 it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then we'll jump to verse 14 because John changes subjects for a minute. In verse 14, he comes back. He says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John comes right out and he says, the Word, Jesus, was in the beginning with God, and he was God. And then in verse 14, he came to earth and became a man. He, he, he became flesh. Paul says it a little clearer in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, that word form means nature. So Paul says Jesus' first original nature was that of God. He says, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So John and Paul both said the exact same thing, just using different words. Jesus' original nature was that of God. He was divine. He took on a second nature. Then he came to earth and he died in our place. Peter says that he is our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And even within the church, Christians will say, no, there should be a comma there. Where Jesus is, or excuse me, where, where Peter is talking about our God, comma, speaking of the Father, and then our Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's our Savior, but he's not our God. You'll hear this even within churches. But there's a Greek scholar named Kenneth Wiest. He's a biblical Greek scholar. I believe he passed away recently. He is a wonderful resource to uh, tap into. This is what Wiest says. He says, the expression God and our Savior 
is in a construction in the Greek text which demands that we translate it as our God and Savior Jesus Christ. The expression thus shows that Jesus Christ is the Christian's God. And so as you learn to study your Bible, you begin to realize there's a lot of people out there, even within the historic Christian church, that say, well, no, 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 the the Father is God, but Jesus is the Son of God, and then the Holy Spirit is God's active power upon the earth. And when you say, hey, prove that to me biblically, they normally can't. And so Peter is saying, Christian, you need to know two things if you are going to stand against false teaching. He says, you need to understand biblical salvation. We are saved by grace through faith and the finished work of Jesus. And he says, you need to understand that a Jesus who is not God in the flesh cannot save you. You need to know the origins of Christ, the nature of Christ. And I'll just share a question real quick. The reason I'm so passionate about this, the reason I invested so much time here talking to you about this, is that when I was a young Christian studying the Bible, some Jehovah's Witnesses came to the door, and I opened it, and I was like, I've been studying my Bible for six months, I got this. And these guys turned me into a theological pretzel in about ten minutes. And so much so that I closed the door and I looked at my wife, Kelly, and I said, I think they might be right. And she's like, snap out of it. (laughs) But I want to tell you what that day did for me. That day turned me from a Bible reader to a Bible student. And I learned to study what the Bible really says by digging into the Greek and the Hebrew and the sentence construction and all of these things. And now... When they come to my door, they'll usually come and I'll open my Bible and I'll ask them a series of questions. And they usually go, we'd like to come back with the Grand Poobah. And then they come back and the Grand Poobah then says, listen, would like to come back again. And they never come back. And what I have found is that my house has an X on it, on their little map. I've had to move three times so that I can keep talking to Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? But I do it lovingly, I do it respectfully, and I want them to see that Christians are not just people that slam the door in their face. That Christians are people who will open their Bibles and show them the truth, because if they don't know the truth, they're going to leave this world unsaved. And Peter says, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to study these things so that you can be used in a powerful way? It leads us to the agenda, and we're going to move quickly here. We get to verse 2, and and Peter says, listen, this is my agenda. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The key words in the book of 2 Peter are know and knowledge. They appear more than 13 times in 2 Peter. But what I want you to understand is that pretty much everything I've given you this morning has been intellectual knowledge. I have just passed information from my brain and my Bible to you. Just lots of information. I hope you're downloading it all, okay? Peter is saying, that's not what I want to teach you. Peter says, I want you to learn all these facts so that you can then experience God. And you can experience, notice these two things, his grace he, he says, I don't want you to learn about grace just to learn about grace. He says, I want you to have a, an experiential knowledge of God's grace, which we learned is God's unmerited favor. It's shown to us at salvation, and then every moment of our life, God's grace is being poured into our lives. And then Peter says, I want you to experience God's, notice, peace. I want you to know God's peace, that you would have peace with God, and then you would have the peace of God, And then notice what he says here also. He says that I want grace and peace to be multiplied to you in the knowledge of the Lord. He says, I don't want you to just get saved and then think that grace just saved you. He says, I want grace and peace to permeate every area of your life and just absolutely transform you. And let me show you this. You've probably heard it, but if you were to go through the New Testament and look at the introductions to the different books of the Bible where grace and peace are used, do you know which word always comes first? Grace. Do you know which word always comes second? Peace. Do you want to know why? 
Because you cannot have the peace of God until you have the grace of God. You can't have peace with God until you've experienced the grace of God. So grace is always first. Peace is the result. And it comes from knowing God. And Peter's going somewhere here. He said, listen, I started out talking to you about how important it is for you to know your Bible. But now he says, it's even more important that you know God and that you have a intimate daily relationship with him. He, he says that the way we experience God's ever-growing favor and his never-ending peace is to focus on building a daily personal relationship with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. And if you look up at the screen, I want to give you something to just think about. Peter's reminding us that the key to a fruitful life is found in our personal devotion time. He's saying, yes, it's so important for you to study and know the truth. But he says, it's more important for you to have a thriving personal relationship with the Lord. Peter is saying the most important part of your day is your daily devotions. And I shared with First Service that um, I'll just be absolutely transparent. You can probably tell I love studying, right? I love studying the Bible. I love preparing to teach. And there's some days where I'll wake up and it's Friday, which is my study day for Sunday. And, and, you know, I'm thinking about, wow, I've got to teach a new book of the Bible this week. I've, I've got to put together a, an introduction and gosh, it's communion and this and that. And I'll tell you where I fall sometimes is that I, I start Friday and I'm like, I've got so much to do. I better just head right to my desk and get to work. And I do that sometimes. And I'll be like, well, God, I'm going to have my devos at lunch. But on Fridays, I go to the gym at lunch. I'm like, okay, well, after I get home from the gym and before I get back to work, then I'm going to have my devos. But I don't normally do that. I get back to work because I've got a lot to accomplish. And then by the evening, I've been studying and working all day. And Kelly goes, are you okay? You seem a little edgy today. Oh, honey, I'm just fine, which is code for I didn't have my devotions this morning. <laughs> and I'm just telling you that, you know, it's everybody. It's pastors, missionaries. We all struggle to have our daily devotions because we think something else is more important. And Peter is saying, all this is important. But you've got to prioritize your daily devotions because that is where we know God. That is where his promises are poured into our life. And so the application, I know you're looking at your clock and you're going, we've got about seven minutes and two more verses but what we're going to do here as we talk about the application of this introduction, we're going to read verses 3 and 4, and then rather than me expositing them the way I normally do, I'm going to give you a couple of sentences as overviews, because what I found is that everything in these two verses, Peter's going to talk about in depth throughout the rest of the letter. So I get to use these to kind of bolster the point that I just made. So let me read verses 3 and 4. This is our application. He says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And I will tell you that it's just killing me not to go through and just exposit these verses to you because they're just pregnant with uh, theology and doctrine and things that you can learn. But we'll get to all of it as we go through the book. What I want to do is, is I want to summarize verses 3 and 4 in three sentences. And I think this is going to be very effective. What Peter says, beginning here in verse 3, he says, Jesus is divine. He is not human. And what he's telling us is that once you're born again, his divine power resides in you through the Holy Spirit and enables you to partake of what Peter calls the divine nature. He says, when you get saved by grace through faith and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you, he, he says, now you don't have a human living inside of you. You have God the Holy Spirit. He says, it should radically transform who you are and you should start participating 
or partaking in what he calls the divine nature. What is the divine nature? Well, it's what God does. It's who God is. You should be more like God. Second thing, this is looking now at verse 4. Peter says the effects of this are undeniable. How do I know if I'm filled with the Spirit and I'm, ex- I'm, I'm partaking of the divine nature? Peter says the effects are undeniable. You're going to begin to escape the corruption of the lusts of the world that you've allowed into your life. Peter says you were once a slave to certain vices and sins and you fall into those same things over and over and over. But when you realize, and it usually comes through your devotion time where you're looking at the promises of God and you're applying them to your life, you realize I'm not a slave to that anymore. I don't have to give in to that. I can participate in the divine nature instead of being a bozo like I used to be. It follows every sinful thing that I want to do. And then the third thing, this comes from verses 3 and 4. Peter's telling us, he says, these things are the result of knowing and walking in God's promises, which is why we have to focus on having a thriving devotional life. Peter says this stuff doesn't happen by accident in the life of the Christian. It happens because we take time every day to spend time in prayer and reading the word and letting the promises of God flow into our lives through his word. So we're going to call it right there, but I want to give you a couple of of takeaways. I want to talk about the author, audience, atmosphere, agenda, and application and just give you a quick takeaway from each one of those. When Peter was talking um, about his identity he, he tells us that identity is so important. Do you know who you are in Christ? And, and if you do, that should be life transforming. You're, you're no longer the hearer that doesn't hear. If you're in Christ, you're the little stone that's about to become a huge rock. That's what God is saying to you today. Let's talk about the audience. The one thing that really impressed me is that they shared Peter's precious faith. Peter said, you've got a like and a precious faith. Do you share Peter's faith, and is it as precious to you as it was to Peter? And then number three and four is all about the atmosphere and the agenda. One of the things that we're going to learn as we get to chapter two is that Peter's audience was being exposed to teachers that were challenging the truths that Peter had taught them. And I want to ask you, who are you listening to? Every once in a while, someone in the church will send me a link. They'll say, PR, could you listen to this Bible teacher? I think they're just, they're saying some weird things. You know what I normally tell them? I don't have time to listen, but stop listening to them. Your spirit's already telling you something's wrong. When they're telling you that UFOs are coming to save us, you probably need to stop listening to those people, okay? But if they're saying, hey, listen, Jesus wasn't actually God in the flesh. Jesus was just activating the God spirit, right? Something like that. Just stop listening to that person. If they're wrong on this, they're going to be wrong on everything. And then the last thing is the application. And that is that the most important thing that we learn today is the value of our daily devotional life. Peter is saying, never, ever discount the importance of your daily devotions. That is where we cultivate that deep relationship with the Lord that lays a foundation for everything else. So, Father, this morning, we want to thank you for these four simple verses that we dug into today, laying a foundation for this study in 2 Peter. Father, there might be people here today or they're watching online, and and they are just being honest with themselves right now, and they're saying, I don't think I truly know Jesus. I've been trusting in being good or being associated with a certain denomination or any other thing. <clears throat> but I'm not trusting in Jesus. I, I'm not trusting that a transaction took place where my sin was exchanged for Christ's righteousness. <clears throat> That's a good place for people to be today, Lord. And I pray that they would just simply say, God, I need to be saved. I am a sinner. I can't do anything to pay for my sin except for trust in the finished work of Jesus and then become his disciple. 
I just pray, Father, that anybody that needs to be saved today would cry out to you. Your word promises that you will not ignore that cry. And then, Lord, for the rest of us, I pray that we would just be sober-minded. Pray, Lord, that we would be humble, that we would be servant leaders. Pray, Lord, that we would be careful who we listen to. There's a lot of false teaching out there, and some of it sounds so good. It appeals to our flesh, but it doesn't feed the Spirit. Give us wisdom, Lord. And then I pray today that you would remind us how you long to meet with us on a daily basis in our devotional time, Lord. That you desire to sit with us so that we can glean from you everything that you want to give us for life and for godliness. And I pray for anybody in the room that's struggling with devotions, Lord, that you would give them a hunger. Lord, a hunger for nothing less than you. Not what you're going to do, not what you're going to fix, not what you're going to give them, just you, Lord. And we praise you and thank you because everything we've looked at today, Lord, has the potential to completely transform us. And then you can send us into the world to continue seeing this world come to know Jesus. Lord, we pray over our lives and our impact. And I want to end this church service by praying for this election on Tuesday. And we pray, Father, for Christians to be participating, to vote biblically, and then we pray for your will to be done, God. So go before us. Bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen.